This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can pull up your home life cameras on your TV with your contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home. This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand? Or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. For those of you who've been with me on this journey through influence marketing for a while, you know that I get really excited when we can zero in on the concept of influence rather than influencers. The whole theme of my book, Winfluence, and a lot of what we talk about here on Winfluence the podcast, focuses on the fact that removing the R from the term means we have a more holistic approach and success with leveraging third parties to influence audiences to take action. In the world of sales and marketing, the term influence gets thrown around, but it often harkens people back to the seminal book on persuasion from Dr. Robert Cialdini called Influence. It was published in 1984 and is still selling well today. In fact, the most recent update actually amended his six principles of persuasion. There are now seven, which my guest and I get into today on the show. That guest is Brian Ahern. He is a Cialdini disciple so much so that he's even been certified as a Cialdini instructor and teaches techniques in influence and persuasion to corporate sales teams, marketing departments, and beyond for a living. I chatted with Brian on Digging Deeper, Cornette's podcast, a few months back. He told me then he was working on a new book. Well, that new book is out. It's called The Influencer, and he's here today to talk about it, but also to walk us through the principles of influence he teaches and how they can apply to our own credibility and influence, but also in practical manifestations like choosing the right influencers to use for your influence marketing efforts. The book, by the way, is a story of fiction, a business allegory, if you will, about a character named John Andrews and his path to learning to become influential. I loved the book. It reminded me of a similar parable approach to business principles, which is probably my favorite business book ever called Happy Work by my pal Chris Reimer. Brian will tell you more about his book, his parable, and influence in today's episode. Before we get to that, though, let's take a moment to thank our presenting sponsor, Tagger. It is a complete influencer marketing software suite that allows you to find, connect, and collaborate with influencers, execute campaigns, and measure success. But as you know, I'd much rather get insight and intel from Tagger's customers about how they use the platform and influence marketing, then just read off some highlights of the product. Meredith Jacobson is an independent influencer marketing consultant and strategist. Her firm is called We Are Boosters. We chatted not long ago about how she uses Tagger. So Meredith, what's your favorite feature of Tagger? My favorite feature is the ability to search backwards, whether it's a brand or an influencer, and be able to see who they're mentioning and who's mentioning them. And why is that so powerful that you know who they're mentioning, who's mentioning them? I think that there's something really powerful in being able to see who they authentically are actually talking about, um, who they've mentioned in the past, whether it's, you know, whether I'm doing a brand pitch or I'm doing a brand pitch for a competitor. It's really cool to see where the brand, if and where the brand fits in already within within the creator's you know, world. And then the, you know, the who's mentioning them, I think that it's cool to see how creators collaborate and who knows who and whether there's opportunities to to tie a campaign together in an even broader way. You know, if you see a certain person's been mentioned 50 times, you can assume, oh, they're they're a friend or they collaborate often. And if you're already working with someone like that, then it's a good it's a good connection to make. Thanks to Meredith and We Are Boosters for sharing her use of Tagger. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. That's jason.online slash Tagger. A business parable of how to build and leverage influence. Brian Ahern is next on Winfluence. This is a great show. 
I know. We've really got some competition out there. Hello there, podcast listener. Hey, if you want another great show to listen to that tackles hot topics in marketing, social media, public relations, and corporate communication, well, then we'd love it if you added Hanson and Hunt to your list of favorite podcasts. I'm Eric Hanson. And I'm Kevin Hunt. And we are Hanson and Hunt. And just like this show, we are part of the Marketing Podcast Network. So check us out sometime. Hanson and Hunt, available on your favorite podcast app. Brian, before we get into your new book, which is great, by the way, um, I want to make sure the Winfluence audience knows a bit about your background. We chatted before on Digging Deeper, my other podcast, but in case there's a few listening out there who don't listen here, give us the Brian Ahern story in a nutshell. Okay. In a nutshell, I spent more than 30 years in the insurance industry. During my time there, I was involved in sales training for field sales associates. I came across the work of Dr. Robert Cialdini almost 20 years ago was so enamored by it that I began to weave it into everything that I was doing. I I really understood that the principles he talked about were the motivation for so much of human behavior. So whether it was sales training, sales coaching, or anything else, started weaving that in. And I was so enthralled with it that I knew it's what I would do with the rest of my career eventually. I ended up getting certified by him to be one of his only a dozen trainers around the world back in 2008. In late 2018, I left the insurance company, and now I run Influence People full-time, teaching or helping people to learn about influence through speaking, teaching, coaching, training, and consulting. Now, I I think the regular listeners here are probably already getting excited because they realize this episode really isn't about influence marketing. It's about influence at a much higher level of understanding, which is what I think is my unique contribution to the conversation in the little influencer marketing space. When you talk about influence and when you think about influencers, particularly one like John Andrews, who's the main character in your new book, which is called The Influencer, you're not necessarily thinking about social media, are you? Correct. The term influencer, as most people understand it, are people who are uh, promoting products and uh, vacation spots and things like that. I, I looked at this and I called it the influencer because I believe that influence is a critical skill for your professional success and personal happiness. And the book follows the life of the young man, John Andrews, as he learns about influence from coaches, mentors, and clients and begins to see the impact it can have on a personal and professional level. Before we get a little deeper into the John Andrews story, and by the way, for those people who know the John Andrews who used to be the CEO of Photofy and is a, a buddy of mine from North Carolina, it's not him. It's a it's a fictional character, but we'll get to that. We'll get to more about that John Andrews in a minute. Um, so I know you know Dr. Cialdini is your mentor. You said you, you've been certified and whatnot. He has actually a new edition of uh, Influence, which is the title of his book, kind of the seminal you know, sales book from 1984 that's in its umpteenth edition, I'm sure. But he's got a new version of that out, which incorporates a couple of his other works and actually takes the six principles of persuasion, which I talk about in my book. So you know, I've, I've been influenced by Dr. Cialdini's work as well. Um, and he's added a seventh to it. Talk to us a little bit about unity. What is that uh, what does that mean in that sort of array of principles of persuasion? And how does that differ from, say, uh, consensus or liking, which are kind of similar, but not the same thing? Okay. Well, so Robert Cialdini popularized what he calls the principles of persuasion or the principles of influence in his first edition, Influence, Science, and Practice. Um, these are universal principles that across the globe, all human beings respond to, to one degree or another. So when he came up with the principle of unity in, I think it was 2016, but he'd been talking about it a little bit before that, when he put that out in his book, Persuasion, people were asking the question, well, why all of a sudden is there a sixth principle? And his response was, it's always been there, but I didn't really see it. It was kind of below the surface. And and so the principle of unity is, we define it this way, it's easier for us to say yes to those who are of us. So this isn't about the principle of liking. It's not about deep liking. It's about shared identity. And one of the best examples I can give you is my father. He served in the United States Marine Corps from 1962 to 1969, did a tour over in Vietnam. From the earliest memories I had, I always had this sense that when dad met another Marine, I felt like he was closer to them than me, his own son, his own flesh and blood. And it wasn't until 
Robert Cialdini introduced the principle of unity that I really began to understand it. My father had a deep shared identity with these other people who served and even more so with those who were in combat because it's an experience very few human beings can share. And it becomes one of those things, I believe, that you can almost look at the other person and you know what they're thinking and what they're feeling and where they're at emotionally because of that deep connection. Now, obviously, there's other examples. I think a great example are religious organizations. You know, that's why we talk about the body quite often. And what do you do when you go to religious uh, places of worship? You kneel together, stand together, pray together, worship together, mourn together. So there's this deep connected uh, connectedness. So I really want to make sure people understand this isn't principle of liking on steroids. This is about having a shared identity. The closest is obviously family. And if you think about it, Jason, we will do certain things for family, even distant relatives, even relatives we may not like, that we probably wouldn't do for some of our closest friends. And it's just because we are genetically wired to carry on our lineage. And that's what unity is really all about. You know, it's it's amazing that that he has been able to coalesce that into a principle because it's really true. I mean, when I think of the people that I have this sort of blind commitment to, it's it's the it certainly starts with family. Um, people that I went to high school with, my hometown, we we have a shared alma mater. People I went to college with, right? That that sort of alumni association with, if you will, is a, a bond that ties a lot of people together. Sports loyalty. If you're a member of a you know fan club for an artist or something like that, the if if you can find that identifying that unifying thing between you and another person, all of a sudden your relationship becomes stronger because you come from a common ground. And and it really, that applies to really everybody, doesn't it? It, it does. There, we all would have those uh, identity groups. The challenge is finding them, you know? And so when you are interacting with people, if you do something that uncovers unity, maybe it is that you cheer for the same team and you have that fraternity, so to speak. My wife's a good example. She's from Pittsburgh. She sees anybody wearing Steelers stuff. She yells, go Steelers. And we could be anywhere. And all of a sudden they have this connection. So when you discover that, you need to raise it to the surface and make sure that you mention it because in your interactions with that other individual, it will make it easier for them to say yes to you. But it also will do this, Jason. We will work harder and put forth our best effort for those that we feel deeply connected to. So it creates a win-win situation where, you know, you and I find that we have this sense of unity. Now I want your best. You receive it that way. And the relationship changes in a very positive manner. So real quickly, just to kind of level set everyone out there, if you uh, haven't yet read Brian's book, which I don't think you have and you need to, uh, or his other books, frankly, or Dr. Cellini's book or my book, which goes over those principles of persuasion. So real quickly, they are, or I'll try to get this right because they've been revised, reciprocity, scarcity, authority, consistency, liking. Consensus has now been sort of edited and changed to social proof, which is very similar. And then there's the principle of unity. I really think, Brian, that those principles are the linchpin of knowing if you're if you're a marketer and you're analyzing influencers, I think those principles are the linchpin of knowing whether or not an online influencer is, in fact, influential or not. When we need to decide whether or not to use a given influencer for our marketing programs, those now seven principles are a litmus test, I think. Do you agree? Absolutely. If you can look at two individuals and what they're doing in the online space, and you clearly see how one is tapping into the psychology of persuasion, whereas the other one is just kind of hit or miss. Maybe it's just about funny videos or things like that. And and not that that doesn't have an impact. Certainly it does. But what we talk about with these principles is they are time tested more than seven decades of research to clearly show that when you engage them the right way, they make a material impact on people's decision to take action. So I would absolutely look for people who already have a sense of being able to incorporate that. Second, I would maybe look at people who are doing things well, but you clearly see, wow, if you incorporate these principles, you're going to get so much more out of your influencer marketing. That would be somebody to work with too, because you've got a large upside. 
All right, let's get into this new book. The title is The Influencer. I think people who listen to this show are going to make some assumptions about what it's about, and they're probably going to be wrong. Give us a little peek inside what this book's about. It's very different from your previous work. Yeah, this book is a business parable. It was the first time I've ever tried to write anything like this. I I don't read a lot of novels. That's just not my thing. I read lots of psychology books and business books, but I've read books like The Go-Giver, um, the Connector's Way and, and other books that are business parables. And during the pandemic, having a little extra time, I thought, could I write something like this? Could I craft a story that would be able to teach the psychology that I've been working with now for almost 20 years? And my goal with it, Jason, was this. There are some people who would never, for example, pick up my first book, Influence People, which is a heavy psychology slash business book. There's a lot of people who won't pick up my second book, Persuasive Selling, because they're like, well, I'm not in sales or I don't want to read a sales book. So this is an opportunity to teach the same concepts to a whole different audience that would gladly pick up a storyline and read through that. And so the book takes a look at an individual named John Andrews. You are literally introduced to him when he is born. You get to meet his family and see his progression as he grows up, because I want people to realize he's an ordinary guy. He's just a typical um, middle-class American kid. He doesn't stand out in any way with his grades or sports or anything like that. He's just an average person. But as he learns a little about psychology and then is at least wise enough to listen to the mentors and coaches, et cetera, and put it into practice, he begins to see the dividends. And so he gets excited about that. And, and that's what really propels him to become extraordinary. But it's not that he possesses anything that you, I, or your listeners don't possess. It's a willingness to learn and then putting into practice the things that he's learning, assessing if it's working, and continues to refine his craft. So I think, you know, and you you kind of underline this a little bit. You you mostly write for an audience of business people, CEOs, salespeople, entrepreneurs, maybe marketers, but this book. Uh, to your point, I think goes a little deeper and broader than that. What can a TikToker or a lawyer or just anyone who's interested in the idea of becoming more influential in all walks of life take away from this book? Well, the book doesn't just look at his business life. It also looks at his personal life. So he meets a young lady and it follows their their journey in life too, as well as his business journey. So people are going to see application on the professional level, but also on the personal level. I hope that they see that if it can make a difference for this person, and even though he's a a fictional person, that he is like them and that, hey, maybe if I try this, maybe I can actually see the same kind of success that he does. I want them to see different application like, oh, I never really thought about uh, utilizing this particular approach. As an example, when he uh, gets a couple of new states for his Uh, sales territory, and he's a medical supply sales rep early in his career, he utilizes persuasion to, you know, get his foot in the door with these potential new clients and and build some rapport so that he can get sales meetings. That's something anybody could benefit from. That's very true. You know, the, uh, I was, I was primed a few years ago for the uh, business parable. Uh, A friend of mine by the name of Chris Reimer wrote one called Happy Work. Uh, It's probably I don't know, 2016 or something like that. It was a while back. It was a very similar style. I loved it. And what I, what surprised me about that book and which didn't surprise me about your book because I was ready for it was how easy it was to read and how kind of in, engaging and entertaining it was. If you're used to reading business books, they're written in this sort of formulaic, here's principle one, two, three, and here are the five things you need to learn under that. And then you here's how you implement it. And then chapter two, here's principle two, and here's one, two, three, and da, 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 da. But you're actually using, you know, sort of, you know, literature, narrative storytelling to say the same thing. So it's a, it's, it's really a super, a super way to do it. Happy work was, is really more about organizational culture, internal communications and such, but super useful. Uh, I, what were the, the challenges for you in writing that way? Because I know it's a very different way to do it. Well, first it was because it was different. I am not, I don't consider myself a creative storyteller. I am good at telling certain stories and and I'm able to refine those. I do those from the stage, but, you know, crafting a book from beginning to end, I didn't have any kind of outline. Uh, People say, well, did you, you know, did you have this outline? Nope. Uh, I didn't know where it was going to end. 
Every day when I sat down to write, I didn't know what was going to unfold next. So for example, I was at uh, Starbucks one day and I thought, this guy doesn't have very much adversity in his life. I need to create a little adversity. I, I made it up on the fly. I created a family situation that necessitated him flying home and and then wove into it uh, that he had met someone at an airport because he treated him kindly. They were nice to him. And so the relationship continues to grow. It was all on the fly. Um, and then again, the same thing with the next chapter. Okay, what's going to unfold next in his career? So it was fun for me because I was creating it as, as I went. When I finally, when I hit the stopping point, I was at Starbucks again, and I remember writing it and I just felt like it's done. It's finished. Yeah. I, I don't need to write anymore. I just need to circle back and clean some things up and, you know, add my um, epilogue and, and the learning summary. But I just knew this is the right stopping point. So that was a pretty cool feeling. Uh, well, I, I, we, we need to know the next obvious question. Where can people find this book online? Where can they get it? And where can they find you? So the the book is available on Amazon and uh, Kindle and paperback. Uh, certainly they can find me on LinkedIn. If you reach out, I'm happy to connect. And I guarantee you're going to get a personal message back from me. I like to know why people are reaching out. And then obviously my website. So if people go to influencepeople.biz, uh, they'll see links for the book on the sidebar, as well as I've been blogging for almost 14 years, every single week, ton of uh, articles that are online, I've been on almost 130 podcasts, lots to choose from there. So a lot of free resources there. There are also previews of my LinkedIn learning courses. So a lot of information out on the website. That's great stuff, Brian. I, I love the story. I love the book and glad to share it with folks here on Winfluence. Thank you for writing something so useful and, and sharing some time with us today. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast is presented by my book, Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.